My name is David Lane, and I'm going to tell you about my new book, Reconstructing Retirement, which explores prospects for work and retirement beyond age 65 in the UK and the USA. Now, it's often said that retirement is changing. This quote reports perceptions that baby boomers are reinventing or revolutionising retirement by combining work and leisure in new and in more rewarding ways. Public perceptions of retirement also appear to be changing, as this cartoon shows. Increasingly, people still expect to be doing some form of paid work after they've retired. And it's also clear that governments and policymakers want us to rethink retirement. Roz Altman, the UK pensions minister, said in 2015 that as we live longer, we need to rethink what retirement looks like. She goes on to say that it's not about forcing people to continue working, but supporting those who want to maintain a fuller working life. In my book, I argue that it's governments and policy makers in the UK and US that have sought to reconstruct retirement by increasing employment at age 65 plus and dissolving the notion of fixed retirement ages. It's done this in two ways. First, it's increased the financial need to be working at this age by raising state pension ages and eroding the safety net of benefits available to those exited from work early. Alongside this, salary-related defined benefit occupational pensions have also been in decline. In addition to these increased financial needs to work, governments have also been seeking to increase opportunities to work beyond age 65. Both the UK and US have abolished mandatory retirement ages, so employers are no longer able to retire off people at fixed ages. In addition, pensions have been reformed, which makes it easier for people to work whilst taking a pension, thereby further blurring the divide between work and retirement. In the book, I argue that in order to understand the significance of these changes, we need to place them in a particular historical context, because the UK and US have both historically had different policy logics or expectations about employment of older people. Both countries have had modest state pensions by international standards and there have been particular problems of low pensions for those with low earnings or broken careers. In this context, occupational and private pensions have been important for bridging the gap, but coverage has always been partial. In the UK, a paternalistic policy logic has therefore prevailed, which focused on the provision of a safety net of means-tested benefits to bring people's incomes up to set levels. In the US, on the other hand, a more self-reliance policy logic has been in operation, which focused more on promoting employment as a solution to low retirement incomes. It's done this through policies such as abolishing mandatory retirement in 1986. With the reforms in the UK over the last decade, the country has moved much more closely to the self-reliance policy logic found in the US. This raises the question of what people's prospects for employment beyond age 65 really are. And in the second part of the book, I explore this through an analysis of the English Longitudinal Study of Aging and the US Health and Retirement Study. I focus on people aged 65 to 74 and I draw in data from between 2002 and 2012. The analysis suggests that we need to recognise three important factors. First, we need to consider the pathways to working at age 65 plus. Policy often assumes extending working lives is as simple as getting people to stay in their career jobs longer. However, working might also require individuals to start new jobs in older age something that happens more commonly in the US than the UK. However, fewer Americans manage to work in retirement than expect to, according to the wider literature. In this sense, opportunities to work at this age in both countries are likely to be less predictable than policy assumes. Second, for many individuals, there are questions about their capability to be working at this age. Low levels of health and education, alongside caring responsibilities, constrain employment for significant numbers. 
Third, many individuals face constraints in their ability to make choices about work and retirement. We know that employment is least common amongst the poorest and most frequent among the richest. This is not surprising when we consider inequalities in education, health and the types of jobs people do. There is considerable evidence of financially motivated employment in the US and we might expect this to increase in the UK following the abolition of mandatory retirement. However, as noted above, we need to recognise that fewer people work than expect to, according to the wider literature. This, therefore, presents real problems for policy. In the final part of the book, I therefore explore current paths and policy alternatives. To recap, a reconstruction of retirement necessitates employment at age 65 plus. But for many individuals, this is an uncertain, unrealistic, or undesirable prospect. We therefore need policy, policies that support choices around employment and retirement, a self-determination policy logic. This involves additional educational provision and support for caring. Alongside this, we also need more financial support and security for older people and a strengthening of age discrimination legislation in the UK. I hope you found this presentation of findings from my book, Reconstructing Retirement, interesting. If you'd like more information, you can go to my website, reconstructingretirement.org. Thank you for your time.